Volando Uno, Argentina Trace. Bright blue and white figures intersect and spin with orange. The ball is white with the illusion of spinning black circles created by so many triangles on its surface. The stands, a house of confetti spilling into the sky and onto the green field below. The audience is a raging beast stomping on the floor and beating the stadium, roaring with each kick. Argentina, Argentina, go no. No one cheers for the Netherlands. Who would dare in the Estadio River Plate or the Estadio Monumental in the south end of the city of Buenos Aires, country of Argentina? 70,000 fans. Still, the Dutch are not intimidated at all. The Hollandeses have a style of play that is fluid, rapidly changing, dynamic. I'll let the Uruguayan writer, Eduardo Galliano, explain it. He can do a better job than me. They call the Dutch team Clockwork Orange, but there is nothing mechanical about this work of imagination that everyone befuddled with its incessant changes. This orange fire flitted back and forth, fanned by an all-knowing breeze, sped forward, then it pulled back. Everyone attacked, and everyone defended, deploying and retreating in a vertiginous fan. A Brazilian reporter called it organized disorganization. And you can see it on the color TV, a flurry of orange players. Overtinted and a little glowing on the edges the way older color TVs gave the image back then. Yet there it is, unmistakable, a blue and white streak, azul y blanca, in a diagonal. On the top left of the screen, now the top right and now, down to the bottom right. He's tied down in so much orange, but then dancing, reversing, until there is no defender. The foolish goalie runs up to grab the ball, but leaves a large, empty, beckoning space. The ball hits the foot. The sound, it was said, was like a jet engine. Goal! It would go on for a bit longer. The orange would never give up. And the last minute, the ball hits a pole coming ever close to scoring. And you'll notice, watching on the TV screen at this time, though so few might have noticed, that on either side of the goal is a black band. Alanda Uno, Argentina Trace. The celebration begins, and fans start crowding the stadium, emptying out into the streets. The entire country is shouting. Again, Eduardo Galliano. Once a week, the fan flees his house for the stadium. Banners wave and air resounds with the noisemakers, firecrackers and drums. It rains streamers and confetti. The city disappears, its routine forgotten. All that exists is the temple, in the sacred place, the only religion without atheists put its divinities on display. Although the fan can contemplate the miracle more comfortably on TV, he prefers to make the pilgrimage to this spot, where he can see his angels in the flesh, doing battle with the demons of the day. We had to win, says Leopoldo Lupe, one of the players. All of these young people, so impoverished, we had to give them something to be happy about. They had nothing. There is something unmistakable, though, about this particular victory. The World Cup, FIFA World Cup of 1978, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Argentina defeating the Netherlands 3-1. to one. There's something unmistakable about it. Joining in the celebrations are the dictators, the generals who had taken over the country. General Videla most prominent among them. Everyone knew what was going on. One of the groundskeepers of the stadium had piles of pictures of people in his office. The victims that disappear. Some knew everything, not all. Not the whole scope of what could be going on. Not all knew that just one mile from the stadium where the greatest celebration is occurring 8151, Avenue of the Liberator, was the Navy's school of mechanics. And it was 
since a coup had begun in 1975. A concentration camp, and more, a prison, and more, a torture chamber. The audience could not hear any screams or see any pain. But the prisoners could hear the cheers, along with the screams of other prisoners, all through that World Cup of 1978. Eduardo Galliano, 5,000 journalists from all over the world, a sumptuous media center, impeccable stadiums, gleaming new airports. Argentina was a model of efficiency. Veteran German reporters confessed that the 78 World Cup reminded them of the 36 Olympics in Berlin when Hitler pulled out all the stops. The cost was a state secret. Many millions of dollars were spent and lost. How many, it was never known, so that the smiles of a happy country under military tutelage would be broadcast to the four corners of the earth. Meanwhile, the top brass who organized the World Cup carried on with their plan of extermination for reasons of war, or just to be sure. The final solution, as they called it, murdered thousands of Argentinians without leaving a trace. How many? Anyone who tried to find out was swallowed up by the earth. Curiosity, like dissent, like any question, was absolute proof of subversion. The president of the Argentine Rural Society declared that thanks to soccer, there will be no more of the defamation that certain well-known Argentinians have spread through the Western media. You cannot criticize the players, not even the manager. The Argentine team stumbled a few times in the championship, but local commentators were obliged to do nothing but applaud. For Norberto Luiski, a campaigner for health care for the poor, in the early 70s. His house was broken into at night. He was shot in the legs. And he was brought in a car and straight from that car, brought to a torture chamber, brought to the school of mechanics. Attacked with a kettle prod. Scorched, burned, humiliated, intimidated. His wife and daughter were also kidnapped. And the soldiers made threats about them. Many gruesome details. He was not alone. Many reported the same thing. Shackled, put in prisons with lots of other people, sometimes brought to rooms where there is no one else, where there is total darkness, bag over the head, so that one lost their sense of time and space. And then they'd hear the soccer cheers. As one journalist put it, this was not in some faraway place. It was death in a city so defined by its life. The wide boulevards of Buenos Aires open up like avenues of Paris. On every corner, glowing cafes swirl with urban life, where today fancy cocktail drinkers sip their drinks in fabricated underground speakeasies. Yes, that speakeasy trend has hit Buenos Aires like everywhere else. Soccer is watched all over the city on television sets. It was death in a city so defined by its life, yet for Lewiski, heard the crowd outside cheering for a goal. And the guards, too, were yelping. They were yelping like dogs every time Argentina scored. And so the prisoners, too, cheering for a goal. Then the guards stopped. That is the last goal you will ever cheer for. Yet he was one of the lucky ones. Norberto Lewiski would live, and in 2014, he would meet the Pope. But 5,000 others never been found. And there's likely near 30,000 victims of the National Reconciliation Process, or the Junta. It was repression in color TV at a time with sophisticated polyurethane-coated Adidas footballs, disco music, 
When Star Wars was the number one movie in America and everyone was learning who Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader were. Cameras and lights on the city. Journalists from all around the world were descending. And some of the restrictions that the junta had put on during the coup, the, the unfortunate restrictions that they had to put on during the national emergency, were lifted for the World Cup. Still, nobody quite knew that so close, not far away, but in different detention centers in the city of Buenos Aires, people were tortured in countless ways, treated like subhuman garbage. All because they had listened to a teacher talk about Marxism, gone to the wrong meeting, ended up in some activist address book, or in the case of one, attended a few meetings because his girlfriend wanted him to. Both would be locked up. He would never be seen again. Or just because, as happened apparently to the daughter of a Swedish businessman, they looked like someone else. Or they were in the wrong bus. The wrong place. It's not something forgotten in Argentina. It's very present. Very present. This won't be news to them. They look at the World Cup of 1978 with some trepidation. There's not as much remembrance of the event, even though it was a world victory. The team is, is Mario Kempes and the rest of the players are celebrated, but not in the same way. Mario Villiani remembers being huddled and a guard allowed them to watch a small black and white TV at the end of the halls. They could sit outside their cells. For an eerie moment, they were allowed to lift their blindfolds. But the guards did not let them just enjoy the game quietly. They pressured them to scream for the team and to say goal during the game. As he recounted, I looked into the TV, the harsh glow of fluorescent lights, and I saw a world that I would never see again. A fellow prisoner he knew of had just been transferred. And it was soon figured out that when one was transferred, there was no other prison, probably drugged. They were going in a plane over the Atlantic and dropped out. This was the matter-of-fact, scientific, deliberate, disappearing process that the Argentine junta that ruled from 75 to 83 had decided on. That it would be no good to fire upon a crowd that would elicit bad publicity. That it would no, be no good to announce the arrest of thousands of people. That would bring shame from the world. There would be no good to try things in the courts. Those sentences could be reversed later. And besides, their goal was to change the culture, to change the politics and society by simply getting rid of opposition. As the foreign minister of Argentina during the junta once said, it may take some time. But the world will soon understand our reconciliation process that we have decided on. Most of the fellow watchers, along with Villiani, did not make it for too much long after the game. How he survived, like most of the survivors, who are very few, didn't know. He knew how to fix the TV set. That could have been a factor. And still, had he not cheered in the right way, in the right guard's vision, could have met the same fate. The coup happened three years before the World Cup. The president of Argentina, Isabella Perón, not a particularly popular president, and a president that in many ways even sided with some of the goals of the junta and the military that had slowly given more and more power to the military, was told that there was an emergency that needed her attention. She was transported on a military helicopter and brought to an Air Force base. There, she was detained 
when the military took control of the country. Immediately, activists were rounded up. And after the coup in the first days, Ford Falcons, usually black, were noticeable all over town with no license plates. And they'd run through traffic lights. Oh, they soon come to be feared because they were associated with the disappearances. The press was turned on to auto center. Everything had to be put before the new emergency national government. And they were told not to print anything about killings or disappearances. Hundreds of reporters were jailed. Many disappeared, never seen again. Defense lawyers were called subversive or anti-Argentino. Newspapers were told to print pro-junta material and to mock Amnesty International and their silly complaints of other groups to deflect attention on Russian or Cuban prisons. The head of a major newspaper decided to print the most pro-junta articles to support the junta in many headlines, but to slip in little notes about the disappearances. No dice. He was jailed and tortured. A British journalist living in Argentina, working for the Buenos Aires Herald, the English newspaper in town, was able to have a little more freedom since his paper didn't immediately interest the junta as it wasn't in Spanish. He started getting visits from people coming to the offices. Judges had told them they knew nothing. Policemen had told them they know nothing. They can't talk about this. Other newspapers they would visit tried to tell them the news. We have a, a relative that hasn't come back from school. We have no idea where they are, and no one will help us. He began printing the names of these people. Robert Cox did, and challenged the government. If you can say where they are, we won't print their name. Few other newspapers joined him. Robert Cox's wife asks friends, Do you hear these stories about people being taken at 3 a.m.? And they would say back, Those are nice shoes you are wearing. It was a strange time, Cox said. Soon, relatives from his wife's family that they had had, a, had great times with were crossing to the other side of the street when he walked down. There are connections between neo-Nazi movements. There were a lot of Nazis that fleed to Latin America, including Argentina. And the Junta banned the Beatles from being played on the radio. It was listed in a group of subversive music. I never got the right word to describe that time. Still don't have it years later. Cox would eventually leave Argentina after a threatening letter with details was sent to his son. Despite reporting which was reaching other sources and despite the complaints of various groups, FIFA decided that the World Cup would remain in Argentina in 1978, although the deal had been made in the 1960s when Argentina's government was not controlled by this dictatorship. And the abuses were not totally known, but they were not unknown. Cox's stories had reached around the world. The Netherlands team had initially wanted to boycott the World Cup. FIFA told them that they would not be able to play for several World Cups after that if they did so. The players were not responsible. Indeed, they were not free from repression entirely. After a close match with Hungary, Leopoldo Lupe says that he remembers hearing from a military official that this could be really a group of death for all of you as far as you're concerned. And there were certainly some controversial games in that FIFA World Cup. There's still a game Argentina needed five goals to advance, and they won 6-0 against Peru. And there's still a lot of questions about that game. A lot of back and forth. Even today, you post something, you're going to get a note from an Argentine soccer fan. So it's still not all known. And we do think that the final game in the Netherlands was played as a legit game. Tate Almeida went to the center of Buenos Aires where the House of Government 
where the junta was ruling the Casa Rosa, where was the pink house, or like our the rose house, like our white house. And circled around the obelisk that celebrated Argentine independence and freedom. And they continued to walk because her son Alejandro went for an exam in 1975 and never came back. The junta would not allow meetings of groups. And so this group that became the mothers of the disappeared wanted to get attention that since there were no official announcements of anything, their sons and daughters have not come back and no one's doing anything about it and demanding answers from the government. World Cup brought journalists and they did extensive interviews. The cause of the mothers was gaining attention and the government did what they could with the more sympathetic critic. These that could not be excused easily as leftists, the, the mothers and the grandmothers. They called them crazy, the locos, so excitable, until they grew and grew. And then they disappeared a few of them, along with two French nuns that were helping their cause and a couple other helpers. Some were found on the shore of the Atlantic, a sign from the government. The mothers didn't stop. With them, it was different. They had already experienced pain and only cared about the memories of their loved ones. Tati talks about watching the game, even though her son was missing and she was mad at her country at a certain point, cheering for the Argentina team, of course, and wanting to spit at the screen. She saw the dictator Videla receiving the players. The Argentine author, Jorge Luis Borges, was known to say, soccer is stupidity. Borges is controversial in Argentina because, as a conservative politically, he initially supported the junta's arrival and was one of, unfortunately, so many conservatives uh, that called for somebody to take over the government after there were bombings and kidnappings and killings of policemen and other disorder. Of course, he said he had no idea what was to come. Borges has a story called Esse Est Percipi that really drives the nail in. It's from the point of view of an old man walking around Buenos Aires, as he would do every day, who suddenly notices that the stadium, yes, the River Plate or Estadio Momental that we were talking about earlier, the same where the 1978 game was held in, is gone. He talks to a friend in the Argentine Academy of Letters to find out. Well, he is not able to offer help about what happened to the stadium. So he seeks out another friend that he knows is the president of a local soccer club. The person seems to barely remember him, even though they've been friends a long time. Borges's character that he's narrating reminds him of players. What about Zarlenga? What about Paradui and their passing attack? The president of the club says, oh yes, and then, to think, I made up all those aliases. Aliases, the old man says. Yes, the president of the soccer club says, aliases. The old man is beside himself. Aren't they real? He names another player, Lamondo. Isn't that the real name of the idol? Acclaimed by fans? Oh, the president of the club says. You still believe in fans? Where have you been? Then he is told that there is no game, no players. The stadiums have long since been condemned and are falling to pieces. The game is only performed by a single man in a booth or by actors in jerseys playing for the TV cameras. Oh, and I suppose you don't believe in space travel either. Putting a man on the moon? That is a Yankee-Soviet co-production. Do you mean to tell me nothing is happening? Very little. 
and I don't understand your fear. Mankind is at home, sitting back with ease, attending to the TV and the sportscaster. It is the march of time, the march of progress. That is Borges. <laughs> little magic realism there. Um, they have the same. So there's that always that contention about sports that it you know sports and politics. It's famous. It gets in the way. I'm not a subscriber to that point of view. I'm a big football fan, and I do a podcast called "My History Can Beat Up Your Politics." The one doesn't stop the other from happening. I mean, yes, it's surely someone can be very obsessed with something like sports and do nothing else. But it's the agency I question. The one doesn't do the other. But you could make this argument about 1978. Soccer was becoming an illusion that was swarming over critiques of the people that Borges had, at least at, for a time, supported. There was no disappearing stadium in Argentina. They wished for a way to make economic problems that the country was suffering. This is the 70s, great inflation, oil crisis. A response to all the criticism that they were getting, the junta went, a little magic realist themselves, in a slogan for the FIFA 1978 World Cup. Their slogan was, Argentina is human and Argentina is right. They weren't alone. Brazil's military dictatorship at this time was bolstered by the team's victory in the 1970 World Cup. Eduardo Galeano, at the Victory Carnival in 1970, General Medici, dictator of Brazil, handed out cash to players, posed for photographs with the trophy in his arms, and even headed a ball for the cameras. The march composed for the team, Forward Brazil, became the government's anthem, while the image of Pele soaring above the field was used in TV ads proclaiming, No one can stop Brazil. Who was noticing? General Videla, who would use the image of Kempes, unstoppable as a hurricane, for exactly the same purpose. Soccer is fatherland. Soccer is power. The country wasn't fooled by these disappearances, not after much time. People saw young girls being snatched up on city buses. People had washed up on the shores from the death flights. Too many people simply were gone for it to be coincidence. A baby born to a disappeared mother in the final seconds of the World Cup game in prison was snatched by the junta to be raised by a family that would be less subversive. When the grandmother and grandfather demanded details, they were told that their daughter had broken a roadblock and had to be shot, and there was no body. 500, it's estimated, babies were taken by the junta and given either to the Catholic Church or to military families, anywhere, so that not only would they disappear people, but do what they could to create a new political generation that would be submissive. The hopelessness of this torture, summed up well by Graciela DeLeo, now a human rights professor. She was one of a few picked out by the guards to actually go in cars and watch the crowds of the World Cup game. Although it might seem like something that would be a special treat for a prisoner to be able to leave the prison and go outside in daylight and see the crowds and see what was going on at the, at the World Cup game. She said, in some ways, nothing was more horrific. At one point, the guards pointed as they drove, as the crowd cheered for Argentina, and said, Who remembers you now? She was allowed to look up from the sunroof of a car. This is how brazen and daring the guards and the military and the generals were at the time. As she remembers, she could have screamed, I'm one of the disappeared. I was one of the disappeared. Please help me. No one in the city streets recognized her. No one cared. It was at this moment that she was more horrified than ever. She was truly, even in daylight, disappeared. Soccer is the world's most popular game, and its intersection with politics is not incidental. There's three billion fans. How could it not? 
We shouldn't be naive about it. Some shake their heads in frustration. I mean, the game is in Putin's Russia. It's going to be with some help or at least compliance from from Russia. In Qatar next, an oil-rich nation which really no soccer fan base or much population to speak of in so many other countries. Yet the game is mesmerizing. And every four years, dear listeners, even your host is somewhat obsessed with it. Leading, I would say, you might have noticed, to a serious deprivation of episodes in 2010, 2014, and 2018, strangely right around the summer. How the junta had come to power in Argentina is complex, and you really have to go into some complexities of Argentine politics that I don't think that there's time for or that would be interesting. You see at this time in Latin America the same mode of operation. Argentina is not unique. Uruguay, Paraguay, Brazil, Chile, Peru. The military says something's wrong with the country. We need order. A state of emergency is declared, and then it seemingly never ends. But it has a lot to do with the struggle on both the left and the right, and the ascendance in the 1940s of Juan Perón, and that is the husband of Evita Perón. Wife kind of made him all the more popular. He was a populist president that had a mix of support both from some ranks of the military and labor unions and many of poorer people and use that political power against others. He was himself caught up in a coup in the 1950s, was in exile in Spain, and Argentina's story, the story that we're telling, starts when he comes back. And having been this kind of Argentina version of the New Deal. The leftists are very excited. They're welcoming him at the airport, and paramilitary groups open fire on them. And then there's fighting between left and right, and you do have violence on the left. There is the, the Monteraneros, or the, the raiders of the night, very well trained guerrillas that are operating in different parts of the country, kidnapping. Western executives, they get people at uh, General Motors. They make millions of dollars in their kidnapping efforts. They assassinate police officers. When one of them are targeted, they target back. Everything is avenged. Bomb is set off in Buenos Aires that kills Canadian tourists and injures many more. And people are looking to Perón, now back in power as president of Argentina. And they're seeing something a little different. And while he is courting some support from leftists and labor unions, they're noticing the bodyguard around him. And then he came from exile from Spain. And Spain is controlled at this time, a right-wing dictatorship. General Franco still in charge there. And he starts cutting ties with the leftist support and aims more on the right. The guerrillas turn up the heat on the Perón government now. They realize there's no ally there. And Perón starts to side more and more with the right. He dies in 1974. His wife, Isabella Perón, becomes president of the country. She had been elected vice president. And it's not like there is absolute peace and freedom and everybody all happy and everything like that in the early 70s either. All through this time period, you had the right-wing paramilitary groups. The one most prominent was known as the AAA, uh, an anti-communist alliance that were assassinating significant labor leaders or anyone that was demanding change.
Nobody walks with coffee in Buenos Aires. I felt pretty silly in Palermo Chico, kind of a trendy neighborhood with swanky stores in the city, holding my cup and walking around like you might do in New York or Chicago or some other place. The woman who made my cortado had to find the cups para ir, cups to go in my bad Spanish explaining it. No one walks with coffee in this city, just the silly estadounidense and his copa. Coffee is for talking, lots of talking, laughing, storytelling, gesticulation in numerous cafes all over. As many as we have banks and as many as we have Starbucks, there are coffees with cafes with tables in the front in Buenos Aires. And they, they call them bars at times. They're really cafes. Some of them are very historic. And I wanted to see them all. I wanted to see everything. I walked and I walked. Avenida Santa Fe, up and down. Avenida Corrientes, Calle Florida. I pigged out on big open-faced sandwiches with ham and french fries and eggs on top. I ate too many empanadas, the best that you could ever eat. Deep dish pizzas. But above all, I wanted to be a porteño and drink the cortado at all of the ancient cafes. You could sit at the table in the cafe forever. You're never kicked out. El Gato Negro, Cafe La Orquidea, Cafe Victoria Cream. Yes, I had an odd affection for certain English words in the right place. And you could get ice cream there for breakfast, too. Cafe Richmond and its hardwood elegance. Cafe Florida, where you would stand and drink your coffee with, with other patrons just as they had for decades. Take that Starbucks. Maybe you should put that one of those in there. I laughed at a place called Kentucky Pizza. Again, they just love certain English words. Kentucky Pizza. Dinner was at nine. You come at seven and you are setting up the tables along with the waiter. Most people were in groups. And to eat dinner, you had to ask permission to comer solo. To, in other words, to take up a table just for one person. Everybody is in groups, but it's always okay to sit at a cafe alone and to sit for hours. They'll never present a check until you ask for it. I walked and walked Palermo Hollywood neighborhood, San Telmo, the Recoleta. In one walk, really, you're going from something that looks like California to something that looks like Paris to something that looks like an old Spanish shore town. I enjoyed in equal measure the Avita Museum and the Museum of the Intellectual Zul Solar. I think it was in the Cafe Violetas with its huge stained glass windows there for decades, there throughout the Junta period, that I realized that history had caught up. I had studied the history before I came. Violetas and the other cafes were meeting points for intellectuals, the beginnings of movements. They were not shut down during the junta for the most part, but one had to be careful about what one said. The mothers of the disappeared, for instance, met in some of the seats at the Las Violetas, quietly to plan their protests that would slowly unravel the Proceso. I knew this as I sat and as I thought. How? This vibrant, colorful place, how could it be shut down forever? How could these people be silenced? It was a nation of talkers. How could democracy, free speech, enshrined in their 1853 constitution, how could it be shut down? I remember thinking it back then, as I'm sipping a cortado, how quickly the spark of democracy can be extinguished. Now you're listening and thinking, oh, he's talking about 2018. He's trying to say that this is happening in America right now. And um, that's not exactly what I'm saying. Uh, this is an extreme vision of how bad things can get. This is a horrific cautionary tale of a quick turn in a matter of months from democracy, challenged democracy, 
democracy with a lot more violence, certainly, than we have in the United States, but still a democracy, a relatively free press to none of those things. It's a tale of what can happen when the press is humbled, when violence is used to snub out under the guise of snubbing out the threat of violence to snub out one's political opposition. More to the point, when violence can be used scientifically, targeted in secret to individuals, it's also where there's nowhere to hide. It's also something very different, where the military is the civilian government and where a group of people are declared subhuman, worthy of elimination. So no, am I talking about America in 2018? No. Am I talking about Trump directly in the story? No. Do I see certain things that are troubling to me, that I think are troubling to many? Do I see attacks on a free press? Do I see separating children from parents? And one could answer, well, that's being done at the border. That's being done for immigration. I worry, and I know many people, that when a mechanism is set up, that it could be used for other things. When facilities are created, they can be used for other things. The people in Argentine prisons were Argentine citizens. Now, let's look at it this way. Let's take the opposite tech. Should we be happy, perhaps, that our battles occur on Twitter in our country? That uh, there is a, not a general in charge of the country, but a president put in charge through the electoral college process that announces different policies all the time, assaults his opposition, attacks the press in a very public way using social media account, using his own speech, his own First Amendment. They did stop Elizabeth Warren once from speaking in the Senate. They did not shackle her up and throw her into the Naval Observatory. He makes fun of people. He calls her Pocahontas. We have a president doing things like this. You know, one could say that's a valid way to look at it. And we should be happy about this. We should be happy that, you know, uh, Sarah Sanders is denied a dinner. And some people, at least for a matter of weeks, are going to be denied eating at that establishment because there are now protests. That this is very different from machine guns turned on one another. That our mentions get full. That there's hate speech in our in our mentions. In that, uh, you know, we can block people that we find annoying. And they may block us, and that's annoying. The president can block people. That's one way to look at it. That isn't it great that so much of this is occurring in social media instead of in paramilitary groups and Montenegro's uh the other way is to think that it's the tip of the iceberg and it's scary. I look at attacks on free speech, on journalists, and it worries me because I know about the history of places like this and also about the Soviet Union, Brazil in the 70s, Myanmar in recent times. Both direct attack on journalists or a kind of subtle intimidation that creates a press that's overly compliant. That's no good for democracy. And any of the historical figures that we study, whether it's like Jefferson and Adams in their letters or Tocqueville, you know this. This is obvious. I worry about, you know, the use of, say, boogeymen, um, gang members and stuff to influence in immigration to, 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 to convince me to stop questioning a government. I look at the use of throw-offs, like, you know, the Argentine hunter used to say, Whenever questioned about their prisons, they would say, well, look at Russia and look at Cuba. Well, that has nothing to do with what you're doing in yours. I'm asking the question of you and looking at those throw offs that are done in rhetoric. I would like to see everyone treated with dignity and humanity. And that's the basis of how I proceed with politics. And I know I'm not alone in that. Whatever problem a government focuses on. You have to be considerate of what the effects are of getting exactly what you want. No, I know for the great writer Borges, and I know for the journalist Robert Cox, whose paper had supported conservative, and for many journalists whose papers had written to please someone to take control 
and establish order in Argentina, that they soon grew tired of it. There are no other words for it, Cox said. State terrorism against terrorism came because we panicked. Everything broke down. Having begun with words of Eduardo Galliano, I think we'll end with them. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later.